Bedouin Press presents 7 and 7, a globe-hopping memoir of disaster and discovery, written by Sven Michael Davison and performed by Sven Michael Davison. Clouds gathered and the bright sunny day turned to dark drizzle within minutes. Due to the dramatic shift in weather, the zodiacs came to pick us up. The bay became choppy and I tucked my cameras in my coat, not wanting them to get soaked as they had twice before. The ride back was bumpy, but we did not get waterlogged. We parked next to the Malshanov gangway. We had to time our embarkation with the swells. At the peak of the swell, our zodiac was next to the gangway platform. At the trough, we were three feet below. Only one passenger could get off per peak. If the swells got any worse, we were told, they'd have to stop bringing people aboard and the remaining passengers would have to wait it out on shore as they had done two years prior. Happily, all made it aboard safe, and we traveled northwest towards King Edward Point. This was the location of Gritviken, the island's largest whaling station. It was also the site of an active British research base. I stood on deck observing the small storm at our stern. Black clouds swallowed the land behind us, but ahead was all sunshine glistening on glaciers and jagged mountaintops. When we rounded the point, I could see the base from our port side, a sparkling white building with a red roof. The rest of the bay was filled with the rusty remains of the whaling station. The old whaler's church could be seen as a white building in the background. I had not observed so many man-made structures in one place since Port Stanley. I spotted a truck cruising down a mountain slope behind the graveyard. The area was coming alive. We'll start at the graveyard and pay our respects to Shackleton, Gunner informed us. Then we'll split into two groups. You can take the walk through historic Gridviken or take the Zodiacs over to visit the base and post office. True to form, I opted for ruins. Gunner reiterated shore protocol as we disembarked from the Zodiac, after which I headed into the graveyard. Shackleton's plot was in the back. His tombstone was a large obelisk surrounded by a small white picket fence. The grave itself was covered in dried plastic flowers. He had died of a heart attack on his third trip down to Antarctica. Jorgen, the ship's bartender, poured rum into plastic cups and gave us each a glass. When everyone had crowded around the grave, Emilio pulled out a piece of paper and read off a quote from Shackleton. He had given us a primer earlier that day on the ship, so we knew what to do. We are participating in a ritual that all Antarctic travelers took when visiting Shackleton's grave. We had seen God in his splendors, heard the text that nature renders, and had reached the naked soul of man. Emilio raised his glass and we followed suit. We asked the boss to protect and guide us on our voyage to Antarctica. Several of us repeated, Protect and guide us on our voyage to Antarctica. We all took a drink, then poured the remainder onto Shackleton's grave. I walked around the graveyard and noticed a surgeon had died here in the early 20th century. I tried to picture life here at that time. No phones, computers, satellites, or central heat. When the doctor had died, World War I had just ended. The world was vastly different back then. I headed off alone for further exploration. I passed elephant and fur seals sunning themselves in green grass or on the surface of half-sunken ships. In 2002, the British government had removed all the outside roofs and walls of the whaling camp for safety reasons and left the machinery standing. This disappointed me because I like to see historical sites intact, but it was better than getting here and having a bunch of fences and folks telling me I couldn't go in. The site was still amazing. I was awed by the size of the place, but I was also horrified. This was a facility constructed to slaughter majestic creatures of the sea. It was an evil place. Yet I was still drawn to and fascinated by the engineering of all this equipment designed to process life into oil. I photographed boilers and a large conveyor belt with scoops to carry blubber to the boilers. Massive chains, each link the size of a small car wheel, lay on the ground. These had been used for hauling the whale carcasses onto the iron flensing floor. The flensing bay had been removed and the ground was all stone now. Photographs from the time showed a gargantuan three-sided steel pit with blood flowing out into the bay. This was a place where men lived and sometimes died over a period of seven decades, starting in 1902. Amelia's grandfather had been a whaler here. He had photographed much of the life in Gridviken in the 1950s. I would have loved to have seen those photos. My own grandfather had worked in a slaughterhouse after he served in World War II. He was a freezer man. He was always cold, but felt it was ten times better than working on the killing floor. The killing floor was hot, slippery, dangerous, and smelly. It reeked of death. There were many shipwrecks in the bay, but the one that grabbed my fancy was the petrol. 
She was sunk in the sand where the blood would have flowed from the vast flensing area. Her harpoon gun was loaded and aimed at what would have been the flensing floor. She was not very big. To think that she'd go out and kill a blue whale and that her crew would then lash the leviathan to the side of her hull and haul it back here seemed crazy. The whale would have been over twice the size of the petrel. I walked to the rear of the camp toward the steep, jagged mountains that framed the whole area. There was a large open space where a movie theater had once stood. Behind that was the double soccer field, and next to that was a white church. A tiny stream flowed on the other side of it. A pile of bleached wood sat on a hill on the opposite side of the stream, the ruin of a ski jump. To the west of the jump were the enormous holding tanks for the whale oil that had been drained into barrels to be exported. A large bunkhouse sat on the other side of the soccer fields. I wandered toward the bunkhouse first and photographed the church through a broken window. I was not allowed into the house, but I could stand in the glass-enclosed porch. I then headed over to the church, which had been restored in the 1990s. It was a very simple place, but it contained photographs of Shackleton's funeral. In the back, there was a library filled with books from the early 20th century that the whalers could check out and read. There was also a small balcony over the entrance for a choir. I wondered how many of those guys volunteered to sing in it. From the front window, there was a view of the flensing floor and the bay beyond. To the right was a huge blubber cookery with smokestacks still reaching for the sky. After the church, I made my way into the museum. There was a very large section on Shackleton, and it was there that I read about the biographical IMAX film about him that was shot in 2002. The filmmakers had found the original bolts of cloth that were used to make the environmental suits that his men wore, and had used it to make authentic costumes for their actors. They had one of the suits behind glass. It didn't look very warm. I studied a dive suit for a man who worked at the camp for 40 years as a ship's mechanic. The suit was made of canvas with a brass diving helmet. A hose was attached to the helmet that snaked upwards to a surface air pump. The mechanic had worn this suit in freezing cold water. One time he had spent 40 days working on a half-sunken ship. He managed to raise it and get it running again. He did it all alone. He died alone. His entire world had been ships and this suit. The museum also offered a history of the station, including its sale to the Japanese in 1964. For four years, the Japanese continued to kill minke whales before finally figuring out the station wasn't profitable and closing it for good in 1968. The station had originally been founded by a Norwegian whaling captain named Larsen, who basically set up all five of the facilities on South Georgia in the 1900s. Larsen also had a fleet of factory ships. He got financing for the construction from the Argentine government, another reason why the Argentines felt they had claim to this island and others. Factory ships had entered widespread use in the 1950s in response to the effects of overfishing. As whale populations were depleted, it became less efficient to hunt them down than drag the carcass for miles to a processing plant. Factory ships could kill the whale and harvest the oil right there at sea, thus accelerating the process of putting whales on endangered species lists worldwide. When I stepped outside, I saw some of the scientists who worked on the research base taking a ladder down from the decks of two rusting hulks. They had been giving a private tour. I was bummed not to be an insider. Emilio approached me and pointed with his thumb at a zodiac sitting a few yards below on the beach. Last boat. The zodiacs are all back aboard the Moshanov. Hmm, I'm guessing I'd need to apply for a job in order to stay. Pretty much. We boarded our ship, and there was an hour to freshen up before our planned back deck barbecue. I took a shower, got dressed, and chatted with Casper before we went up to the bar for the daily recap. Several workers from the Grit Beacon base were there, including our new crew member and marine biologist, Colin. Colin was an Englishman, about five foot six, a waxed bald head, and light in frame. I sat with a tall British chap in his early forties. He had arrived at the base in November and was signed up for fourteen months. He loved to snowboard and he talked about how they would hike up the mountain and snowboard down behind the church. I later found out he was the base commander. The head of the British Antarctic Fisheries was also present. A tall man with white hair, he had a home in the south of England but lived on South Georgia six months out of the year. He loved his job. I'm quite proud of the fact that we've been able to sustain the population of the local Patagonian toothfish, he told me. South Georgia is turning a profit on its fishing licenses. 
I marveled at the number of people present who had chosen the path less traveled in life. They were all genuinely happy. I wanted a similar life. To do what you love and love what you do is the true pursuit of happiness for me. I loved to be busy, but I did not want to be busy doing something that I felt was less than noble. I admired those who contributed to the betterment of our world on any scale. I longed to do the same. Maybe you can be a forklift driver in McMurdo. At least you'd be around people like this 24-7. As I'd promised myself I would, I took the weather for the next day. Lucina, who was on the other side of the bar from me, had raised her hand as well. I had no idea we both had the weather. I said it would be sunny all day, with wind at ten knots. Lucina said something similar. After the daily recap, everyone shuffled to the back deck, where we had barbecue in 18-degree weather. It was 8 p.m., and the sky was still bright, though the Molshanov sat in the shadow cast by a 9,000-foot South Georgia peak. As soon as the sun left the bay, the wind kicked up, and it was very cold. Despite my alcohol buzz, I had to go back to my cabin to don my Antarctic parka. I returned and struck up a conversation with a gorgeous marine biologist who Casper said was dating Gunner, though then I heard Gunner was dating someone else. Either way, she was signed up for another 12 months on the base. I must have been hitting on her pretty hard because she excused herself and never came back. I was definitely in search of my soulmate. I felt I was long overdue. The only woman in my past who had come close was Chloe, and I had walked away. I wanted true companionship, and I wanted to get laid. I had confused the two desires many times in my past to my own detriment. The barbecue lasted until about 9.30 p.m., when it just got too bloody cold to be out back any longer. The next morning at breakfast, I sat across from Paxton, a retired doctor who was living in a southern suburb of London with his wife, Victoria. They had both been medical doctors in Africa back in the 1970s. At that time, the British government paid doctors a better salary to work in Africa than in the UK. Paxton worked in Nigeria and he, Victoria, and her then-husband took vacations together. They had all climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Was there a lot of snow back then, I asked? Oh, yes, he replied. There's almost no snow there now. They had also taken trips to Mauritania, Tanzania, and many other places on the continent. Paxton did not go into details, but Victoria had two children by her first husband, and it sounded like Paxton had a son by his first wife. They both divorced and married each other later in life. I kept comparing their experiences to the English patient. Only their story didn't happen during World War II, and there were no Nazis. But it was Africa and a love triangle. I thought it had the beginnings of a good story. By 8 o'clock, it was time for our Zodiac landing at Gold Harbor. We witnessed a rainbow stretching from one end of the harbor to the other. As with all the bays we'd seen, there was a massive glacier in the distance. A small stream separated the dark gray beach from the hills and mountains beyond. Everything had a volcanic look about it. The beach had an added bonus. Very few fur seals. There were several elephant pups, a big group of adolescent bulls, a small gentoo rookery, and a good population of kings. The local population was very curious about us. Nancy, from San Francisco, kept getting nibbles from a king penguin chick while a 400-pound elephant seal pup began gumming Hyam's boot, then his knee. He tried to pet it, and the seal jerked back when Hyam raised his hand. Then Australian Stan sat down next to him, and the pup turned his attention to Stan and began gumming his hand. A minute later, Stan held up his slimy appendage. I think the little bite is getting teeth. I got grooves in my hand. Eventually, the seal lost interest in people and waddled off. I walked around and noticed skewers eating an old penguin corpse. I also spotted a petrel feasting on the remains of an elephant pup lying in the stream. Then I overheard there were gentoo chicks behind the big elephants. I waded the stream to get a closer look. About this time, we heard a loud rumble from the mountain to the north. A small avalanche of glacial snow was falling. Clouds gathered. The sky turned completely gray. So what's up with the weather, Sven? Stan razzed me. Is this what you faux Swedes call sunny? I laughed. It'll clear up. Just give it an hour. You have some intel, or are you just making that up? Just making it up. Good on ya. Our next landing was further south, where it was sunny again. The cork team beached the Zodiacs at Cooper Bay. Cooper had far more fur seals. We had to run the gauntlet to get inland. I thought it would be a great location for a sealer's cave. After a quick hike led by Emilio, and interrupted by a brief snowball fight involving some of the more restless hikers among us, 
I made my way back to the landing site. Casper and Hyam stood around at the waterline. A female fur seal rushed out of the water and charged Hyam. He stood his ground and yelled at her. She stopped, snorted, and waddled to the dry sand, wearily watching Hyam and Casper. We reached the ship just as the wind picked up. By the time the last boat was aboard, the waves were high and the wind whipped at great speed. Gunner had to cancel a planned cruise into Dragalski Fjord. As we continued south, a wall of black closed in on us. The wind got worse. You want to ride on the top deck? Casper asked me. I'm game. We put on plenty of warm gear and hung out on the deck above the bridge, giggling like schoolboys as the wind blew us around the wet deck plating. Casper pointed to the black storm ahead. We should hang out up here until we hit that wall of weather. You're on, I replied. The world turned dark and ominous. The wind howled around my hood as we watched the icebergs cruise past. Huge waves smashed into the bow and white water shot all the way up to the bridge. Casper and I laughed. The ship was tossed hard and I felt like I was in a Buster Keaton film the way the wind was blowing us around. Finally, the ocean became so violent we had to get back inside. We hung onto the rails until we entered the bridge, shedding buckets of water and laughing. So how was the weather today? Gunner asked us that night. Rough seas, barked Richard, a retired bassoonist. We had to cancel our final landing, someone pointed out. I don't know, Australian Stan winked at me. Oh no, it was pretty good. Here, here, shouted Antoinette. Gunner turned to Lucina. What would you like to drink? At this injustice, Stan and Antoinette shouted out, Hey, Sven had the weather too. I felt a little bad for Lucina the way my constituency was acting, but I was happy to have friends in my court. Gunner turned to me. Okay, Sven, what'll it be? Long Island iced tea. As long as I was getting a free drink, I figured I'd make it a potent one. Gunner smiled at me. Yeah, you order those all the time, right? He knew I was not racking up much of a bar tab. I don't think my weather prediction impressed any of the attractive women on board either. At dinner, I sat with Oscar, Antoinette, and Imogene, and we imitated penguin calls. We laughed pretty hard at our own antics and wound up being the last table to leave the galley. I woke up at five the next morning. The sun was up, but there was a mist outside, and looking out my window, I thought we were stuck in a whiteout. As it turned out, we were passing a seven-mile-long iceberg that was twice the height of the ship. It was like cruising past a snow-crusted island with a sheer cliff wall. Casper and Einar were still sacked out. Einar had been fighting seasickness since leaving Argentina, while Casper was hitting the bar every night and then hanging out with Grigori until early morning. Later, after breakfast, Casper and I ran into Colin, who was talking with a few passengers about his favorite organisms. The marine biologist was getting quite the reputation for being the most enthusiastic man on the planet on the topic of krill. Casper cleared his throat and began to sing the Monty Python song Spam, only he replaced the word spam with krill. I couldn't help but join in as well. Okay, guys, Colin chuckled. I get it. Too much talk of krill. I don't remember much of the day other than finishing some postcards and going to all three lectures, including Collins's, titled River of Krill, and accompanied by some very impressive photographs of the now infamous zooplankton. During our nightly recap in the bar, Casper took the weather for the coming day. I pulled Gunner aside. I've written a little song about the Molshanov. Mind if I sing it during tomorrow's recap? I was channeling my high school self. I had come out of my shell due to Dan and our band. Singing on stage earned me my first girlfriend. At the urging of Casper, I wrote a silly song about Antarctic wildlife to impress my fellow passengers and perhaps the ship's doctor. Gunner shrugged. Sure, give me a signal after the announcements. Thursday, December 14th, 2006, I got up to find ice all over the outside of the ship. Ice coated the lines, the lamps, everything. Ryan, the ship's doctor, had come down with a bad cold, which had started with Bruce and was making its rounds among the passengers and crew. Casper was now saying that Gunner was sleeping with the fair doctor. If I reviewed my conversations with Casper over the past several days, Gunner was sleeping with every attractive female who lived or worked in the vicinity of the Antarctic Peninsula. He was rapidly gaining the legendary status of James Bond or James D. Kirk. I went to the bridge where Sasha was on duty. He walked me over to the navigation table and showed our progress on the massive paper chart. We were getting closer to the Antarctic Peninsula. Gunner had had to change our day's plan, since we had lost some time to the storm we had hit when departing South Georgia. 
He moved Emilio's planned talk to the morning, and we anticipated a landing at South Orkney Islands in the afternoon. Later that day, we dropped anchor in the South Orkneys and cruised out to an icy hill. This time, we encountered a few thousand Adelie penguins, and I was happy to see a new species. Out of all the penguins we had encountered, Adelies were the feistiest. The males and females went through a whole ritual as they traded shielding the chick duties. One parent would come back from the sea filled with krill to vomit up for their chick. Then the parents would squawk and bitch for a good 15 minutes as they traded places. Skewas were everywhere, and the chicks were definitely vulnerable. Bruce was at my side again. He always seemed to appear when I was observing penguins. Smaller penguins, like the Gentoo, Chinstrap, and Adelaide, lay two eggs. Sometimes the extra egg is just a throwaway to give to a skewa if the parent is unable to fend off the predator. Sometimes a chick is lost, and then another egg hatches to replace the lost offspring. Or you get two chicks, and one will die. Another option is that two chicks hatch, and if it's a good krill year, both live. Imogene chimed in. I saw three skewer gang up on a gentoo back at the Shackleton Trail. One pulled on the gentoo's tail, another was in its face, and there was one at the side to try and snatch the chick, but other penguins in the colony all ganged up and got rid of the skewer. The chick was saved. Eventually, it was time to go. As we came closer to the recap, I became more and more nervous. I wanted to sing my song to the theme from Gladiator, and I did not have a music cue written on my page. Gunner gave Casper his drink for calling sunny weather while Imogene volunteered to take the weather for the next day. I nodded to Gunner, and he turned the floor over to me. I told a joke about getting dating tips from the mating behavior of Adelie penguins, and everyone laughed. Then I stood in silence, staring at my lyric sheet, trying to remember the tune I was going to sing to. I attempted one verse, but the music wasn't right. I looked up at the crowded bar. Every single passenger stared at me. I blushed. Thanks for your patience, folks. I'm going to have to try this again when I can remember what tune I wanted to sing along with. Several people laughed. I felt like crawling into a lifeboat and disappearing for the night. When morning came, we were greeted with a gray sea under a black sky. After breakfast, Casper invited me to celebrate St. Lucia with the Swedes. Dagmar planned to serve mulled wine, raisins, and cookies. She had packed them in her luggage and hauled them all the way from Sweden for the event. The small gathering took place at noon, just after Zara's geological lecture, with myself, Einar, Casper, Dagmar, Gunnar, Sophia, Jorgen, Helena, Agnes, and Dr. Smith crowded into the bar. Sophia passed out paper cups of mulled wine, and Dagmar opened a package of thin ginger cookies. What's the story behind St. Lucia, I asked. Dagmar answered, St. Lucia had her eyes gouged out and was crucified for believing in Christ. The candles are all about the divine light she saw. Lucia's birthday is December 13th, which in the old calendar was the shortest day of the year. The celebration is about bringing light in the darkness. Casper cut in. Girls dressed in white gowns with electric candles in their hair. Boys dress as wizards. Wizards, I asked? Gunner rolled his eyes. Think medieval clothes to reflect the time. All but Dr. Ryan and myself sang the St. Lucia song. Casper later told me the Swedish lyrics were about Lucia bringing light and hope to intellectual, spiritual, and physical darkness. After the song, we had another round of mulled wine. I must have eaten 20 of the little ginger cookies by the end of our gathering. Happily for Casper's prediction, soon the sky cleared up and we had sunshine all the way to Elephant Island. I had pictured the island as a rock in the middle of the ocean, but it was a substantial landmass with a cluster of jagged peaks jutting up from the sea. As we approached, we saw the tiny four-foot strip of sand where Shackleton's men had survived during the months of waiting on Shackleton to rescue them. The Endurance crew had lived on penguins and seals, whatever they could catch. We also saw the three caves where the men took turns hanging out during low tide to get some solitary time. By the time they were rescued, it had been over two years since they had left England. Two of them wound up fighting in World War I and dying in it. How tragically ironic. The water was calm as we took a Zodiac cruise around the island. I felt like I was one of the only few thousand people who had ever been here. Only nature and the weather govern this place. I could identify with the isolation of Shackleton's men. As we rounded the rocky peninsula that supported the caves, I saw something that shattered my image of Elephant Island. There on the beach, surrounded by chin-strap penguins, some seals, and a juvenile blue-eyed shag, was a four-foot stone plinth 
atop which was perched a bronze bust of the Chilean captain Shackleton had enlisted to come down and rescue the Endurance crew. It was bizarre to think of the effort the Chileans had spent to put a statue in such a remote part of the world. How many souls had actually seen this bust? It was a monument for penguins to crap on. At one point, as we puttered about, Casper spit in the sea. Gunner, who was driving our Zodiac, barked at Casper in Swedish. Whatever Gunner said must have really pissed off Casper, because he promptly turned to me and started speaking in Swedish. I gave him a bewildered look. He shook his head before switching to English. He told me not to spit. What difference does it make, here in the middle of the ocean? I nodded. When we were finished observing wildlife, we went into the main bay, and Gunner took us right into a vast field of broken glacier ice. We got hung up a few times on large ice chunks. At one point, Gunner leaned over and grabbed a hunk of ice about the size of a standard carry-on suitcase. He broke off some ice and offered it to us. It's salty at first, but then you'll taste water that could be a thousand or more years old. I took it, and so did Hyam. No one else did. Casper continued to fume. As promised, the ice was salty for a split second, and then it tasted pretty damn good. Was it better than any other ice? It tasted like it, but that could have been the pitch Gunner had given us before I popped it into my mouth. A few minutes later, Gunner's radio squawked with Jorgen, the bartender's voice. Don't forget to bring some ice for the bar. Gunner smiled and radioed back. Already have some in the boat. We passed a large wall where Wilson's storm petrels roosted. I was once again amazed at how prolific life was, no matter where you were in the world. Back on board, Casper stewed as we took off our gear. Gunnar has such a double standard. He does things because this is his father's company and he is the leader. He would never allow anyone else to take boats into the ice like that. They could throw a prop and then they'd be stuck. Casper hung his jacket up in our tiny closet. In my youth, I would have started yelling at him for the spitting comment. Gunnar is just in the mode of don't take anything, don't leave anything behind. It was the ocean. I think he just needs to be the alpha dog. Casper shook his head. He bitched some more, but I could tell he was calming down. That night before the recap, I had one of Swedish Jorgen's drink specials, a spirit of Antarctica. It was not very good, but it was loaded with the glacier ice we had picked up in the bay. Once we were all assembled, Gunnar stood in his usual spot by the bar. Let me see a show of hands who is going to swim at Deception Island. I raised my hand, along with a few others. Gunnar counted. So, about 27 of you. Does anyone know what the temperature is inside the caldera? It's volcanic, right? So it has to be pretty warm, Richard the bassoonist replied. Gunnar shook his head. Outside the caldera, the ocean is a chilly minus one degree Celsius, about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside the caldera, the gases coming up from the active volcano heat the water to about plus one degree Celsius, so about 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Gunnar smiled. So how many people are going to swim now? Douglas, an anesthesiologist from Utah, leaned over to me. Are you still going? Absolutely. I raised my hand again. Douglas followed suit. I made a bet for a hundred that I would do it. Gunnar counted and was visibly disappointed. Twenty-two? Almost everyone volunteered on the last trip. So let's see a show of hands. What counts as a swim? Up to your neck or head below all the way in? Everyone, even those swimming, voted for head below water. Gunner was pleased with the consensus. Okay, you can wear a bathing suit or go natural, as some of you Europeans like to do. Imogene got a glass of wine for a fantastic afternoon, and Antoinette took the weather for our swim day. I had a few more drinks with Stan and the regular bar crowd, and then went up top to watch the sunset. The blazing orb did not disappear below the horizon until 11.30 p.m., and even then the sky did not go completely dark. The next day started perfectly. The sun was in full glory when I awoke. Casper had been up until 1 a.m. with Grigori, the Russian second mate who worked the night shift. Jorgen, the bartender, had also stayed up and had captured two killer whales with his camera. This was the time to be staying up to see Antarctica nights. I told Casper I was definitely going to join them the coming night. I was on deck most of the morning photographing icebergs. We passed a bay where a Russian base radioed our crew to say hello. A ship called the Explorer 2 was also in these waters conducting a tour. Bruce was with us on the bridge and gave us some information. She carries close to 300 passengers. Not huge compared to most cruise ships, but it sounded like a monstrosity to those of us aboard the Molshanov. Bruce continued, Most of the tour ships down here are so large they have a lottery system for shore landings. When you board, you get a letter, A, B, C, or D. They call your letter, 
and you get about forty-five minutes on shore before they gather you up and take the next letter out. You don't get three hours or more like we do. We're lucky we can always travel together. Soon chin-strap penguins were spotted swimming off our bow. They leapt out of the water like dolphins as we drew near to Deception Island. As the island grew in size, I could see black ash on the snow-coated volcano. A nearby waterfall pounded a sandy beach. Volcanic dust melted tons of snow. Water flowed out of tubes under the ice. We made landfall, and I marveled at the high, scalloped cliffs where Wilson's petrels nested. A thin stream trickled down the center of a washbed, which had become a two-lane freeway for chin straps marching to and from the ocean. We followed the lane bound for inland to a huge chinstrap rookery. Upon closer inspection, I noticed all the penguins panting under the hot sun. The temperature was a record high of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The Russian base told us it was below zero here just two weeks ago, Bruce commented. I watched several chin straps waddle up the hill carrying stones in their beaks. One of them spotted a rock the exact same size it was carrying and tossed away the rock in its beak in favor of the identical one on the ground. Not the brightest of creatures, it struck me. Bruce noticed my penguin observation. The chin straps build their nests out of stones that they find. The idea is to build a large, solid nest that will impress a potential mate. I can't tell you how many times I've watched one pick up a stone, walk ten feet, see one exactly the same, and drop the one in their mouth for the one on the ground. Per usual, Bruce then stepped away to take a deep dive alone into the rookery. I wandered further upstream and bumped into Imogene. She was radiant with a new revelation. I just saw a hilarious sight. Do tell, I smiled. A chin strap was walking around with tentacles hanging out of its butt. It would walk, then try to push it out, at which point the tentacles would wave. Then it would walk some more, and the process would happen all over again. Hilarious! Get a photo? She held up her empty hands. That's your department. I may have been the only one who observed it. I thumbed my camera. How far back did you say you saw it? Maybe hundred yards back, she pointed. In that patch over there. I saw a hundred penguins in that area she had indicated and decided I wasn't going to spend my limited time trying to locate Mr. Squidbutt. You'll have to let Colin know they like other critters besides krill. Before I knew it, it was time to head back. The Moshanoff cruised past Neptune's window, a gap in the volcanic island's face where people could look out at the sea toward the Antarctic Peninsula. Then she glided through Neptune's bellows, two great rocks at the mouth of a natural harbor. As we headed into Deception Island's caldera, a red sea otter float plane roared over our heads. To the west side of the entrance were the remainder of a 1908 whaling station, a few ice boats, and quite a few whale bones. Heading east from the whaling station, there was a very large, rusting geometric object, which Dr. Smith told me was the remnant of a ship's dry dock. This was the spot where Gunner and Emilio were going to dig a hot tub, and erase it later, for our swim. East of that was the whale oil processing plant and storage tanks. From there, we could see abandoned Chilean and British research huts. The British had been here until 1993, when the caldera erupted and they evacuated everyone. Once we were sure, I beelined it for the abandoned research station, while everyone else went for the view at Neptune's window. Einar and Dagmar joined me, as did Emilio and Zara the geologist. Einar and Dagmar went over to the gravesite, and I cruised to the living quarters. I thought about going inside, but Zara rushed up to keep people out. She took safety to extreme levels. I got it. I just didn't like it. I walked towards the hangar and was alone for a while. As I was planning to sneak into the hangar, Gunner showed up with Dr. Ryan Smith. They just strolled in, and I quickly followed. So I went to hear you sing, Sved. Dr. Smith's Welsh accent was still a bit stuffy from her cold. I observed them both and wondered if they wouldn't rather have a quiet moment together. Well, perhaps tonight. I winked and headed out. I explored more of the cabins and the oil cookery, then Gunner and Dr. Smith started to walk toward me. So I went a different direction. They matched my course and speed. It was obvious they were trying to intercept me, so I turned and waited for them. What's up? Gunner addressed me as he might one of his staff. It's time to sing, Sven. Follow me. I wasn't sure what prompted the urgency of the request, but I was not about to deny a command performance. Gunner and Ryan headed toward the giant oil storage tanks. The first was sealed, so Gunner led us to the furthest one back, which was open. We stepped into a huge dark hall, ten times bigger than a grain silo, with a damp and muddy floor. It was hard to believe the space had once contained the liquefied remains of whales. 
I cleared my throat and launched into Frank Sinatra's rendition of Makin' Whoopi. My voice boomed inside the massive steel tank. When I was done, they both laughed and applauded. I felt redeemed from my failure at the recap a few days before. Gunner headed off to dig the hot tub, while Ryan and I walked to Neptune's window. We sat on the volcanic sand, and somehow our talk turned to dating. She mentioned a man who was booked on the next trip, a friend she was looking forward to spending time with, and I felt this was a subtle way of saying she was taken. I began pushing her to date this friend. After a while, we got up and headed for the top of the slope and Neptune's window. Douglas was there alone. Are you going to swim? I asked Douglas. I don't think so, Douglas responded. What about the hundred bucks? It was a bet from a guy who can be flaky. I'm heading back down, Ryan interrupted. I've got to set up the defibrillator. Okay, Sven, you're an idiot. You're talking to a guy from Utah when you should be chatting it up with the beautiful Welsh doctor. I made a quick exit with Douglas and chased after Dr. Smith. I pushed her a bit more on the subject of the man coming on the next cruise. Perhaps I would date him, Sved, but he's a bit old for me. How old is too old? He's 70. She looked over my shoulder at Gunner and team digging the hot tub. I really need to get ready for the swim. As I watched her walk away, I began feeling self-conscious about my weight and how I'd look in my swimsuit. She'd only seen me in black cold-weather gear. Oh well, she either likes you the way you are, or she doesn't. At least she's single. I photographed some half-disintegrated ice boats and more whale bones before I realized people were swimming. I sprinted toward the hot tub. I arrived just in time to see Colin and Casper doing an abbreviated synchronized swim routine in the caldera, which consisted of kicking up and spinning once before running back to shore. Dr. Smith was sitting a few yards away next to the Molshanus defibrillator, just in case someone went into cardiac arrest when they hit the cold water. By the time I was down to my swimsuit, the hot tub was full. The hot tub was a shallow canal cut into the volcanic sand. The water was only a foot deep inside. One had to lie down flat in order to achieve the benefit of the volcanic steam venting up through the coarse black sand. Colin and Casper were still in. I sat down to wait my turn, thinking that people were warming up in the hot tub and then running into the water. The air temperature was probably 45 degrees Fahrenheit, but it was bright, sunny, and without a cloud in the sky. Are you going in? Zara asked. Absolutely. I stood up and headed for the hot tub. A few of the folks laughed. Colin pointed to the black water in the caldera. No, you have to go in there first, then the hot tub. Ah, got it. Okay. I turned and ran straight toward the water and dove in headfirst. My skin felt like it had a million needles piercing it. As I crashed into the icy water, I realized I still had my sunglasses on. They were my only pair, and the ship didn't sell any, I recalled with dismay, as the force of the water ripped them off my face. I quickly dove for them, in spite of my whole body demanding that I surface, not go further into the murky ice bath. I grabbed at my shades with my eyes half shut. It took two attempts to finally snatch my sunglasses. My whole body burned and shook with cold. The moment I found myself holding my glasses, I stood up and ran back to shore, trying not to gulp air from the shock of cold. I found a spot in the hot tub and lay down. The water was milky and about 70 degrees. Not exactly a hot tub, but far warmer than the 34 degree water I had just hit. I lay there for a couple of minutes until I stopped shaking. After my initial warm-up, I hopped out, wrapped a towel around me, and walked over the coarse volcanic sand. I parked my ass behind the dry dock to trade my bathing suit for warm, dry clothes. Then I hopped in a Zodiac to head back to the Molshanov. When I walked up the gangway onto the deck, Jorgen handed me a hot chocolate with rum in it. I took the steaming cup from his hands. Thank you, good sir. Cool, was it? I hope my nuts return before the new year. I smiled and walked out on the deck to watch the cork team erase all evidence that we had ever been there. Once I finished my drink, I ran down to take a hot shower. A half hour later, we all amassed in the bar for our standard recap. As we waited on Gunner, I consumed a second mug of hot chocolate with rum and bought Casper a vodka cranberry. Then Gunner addressed us all, as bright sunlight streamed through the window. It had been a perfect day. I'm very disappointed in today's showing for the polar plunge. The last time we were in the caldera, 37 of the 48 passengers swam. A few passengers poo-pooed his remark. He raised his index finger. Plus, it was snowing, and we had 30 knot winds. Exaggeration, Stan shouted out. Gunner turned to Stan. We have it all on video for those of you who doubt me. This group had 40 degree weather and clear blue skies, and only 15 of you swam. We owe the weather to Antoinette, Stan shouted. Everyone applauded her and Gunner had her come up to accept her drink.
By the time dinner was over, I was fairly buzzed from drinking two glasses of wine on top of my spiked hot chocolate. The sea was very calm and the sun was brilliant. I strolled back to the bar because we had a couple hours to kill before sunset, and I was planning to stay awake through the Antarctic night as I told Casper I would. By now, I was pretty friendly with the Russian crew and most of my fellow passengers, as well as the cork staff. When I entered the bar, Casper invited me over to the port side where Gunner held court by the entrance to a storage room. Amelia was by his side, and so was Swedish Jorgen. Dr. Smith sat by Casper while Isaac, the middle-aged man who owned an ad agency in Indiana, sat by Emilio. Stan and his drinking buddy, Buck, were across the room drinking at the bar in their usual spots on the starboard side. Gunner must have tied on a few too many because he was complaining about the passengers. Emilio and Jorgen stared at him with slack-jawed shock. I shared in their surprise. Gunner raised his hand high above his head with his palm down flat as if measuring someone tall. She doesn't deserve to get a certificate because she didn't go all the way in, just up to her shoulders. I soon learned that the cork staff had a set of hand gestures representing unfun, complicated, or difficult passengers so they could complain about them to their colleagues more safely. At least four passengers on our boat had been assigned these gestures. Emilio jumped in. I had to be with... He flashed two hand signals. While I was digging the hot tub. You get two points for that, Gunner commented. Dr. Smith flashed another sign. I get points for when he did that thing the other day. Oh yeah, yeah. Emilio, Jorgen, and Gunner nodded in agreement. I was dying to know what had happened, but I wasn't quite ready to join the fellow passenger bashing. I was also surprised the staff had a point system for managing time spent with the troublemakers. None of the people on the ship were horrible, and I got along with nearly everyone. The conversation tarnished my romantic image of our harmonious microcontinent, but then again, it made me realize everyone was human. From this evening onward, I would see the Quark team use the signs and know exactly which troublemakers they were talking about. It was damn funny, and I was damn glad not to have a sign, or at least not one that I knew about. After the complaint session, the Quark crew headed out. Casper and I reconvened in our cabin. I thought that was very unprofessional of Gunnar to talk that way about the passengers, Casper confided in me as he loaded a charged battery into Gregoria's camera. I had to agree, but in my buzz state, I was still entertained by the gossip. Are you still a little mad about Gunnar chastising you for spitting in the water? Casper shook his head. No, this has nothing to do with that. I headed back out to see if I could find Dr. Smith. I was thinking about the conversation we had had on the beach and how Gunnar had pushed us together in the whale oil tank. Was she interested in me? I wanted to buy her a drink and find out. I found Emilio on his way to take a leak. Stan and Buck were in the background at the bar. Have you seen the good doctor? I asked. Emilio shrugged. She and Gunnar turned in. Together? Emilio waved at me and staggered to the head. I wasn't sure what his response meant. The only thing that seemed clear that night was that anyone who was up and not on duty was getting plastered. I went down to the doctor's cabin. The door was open, and it was dark inside. I didn't think someone who was sober and getting over a bad cold would leave their door open while sleeping. I assumed that she was with Gunner. I decided it was just not meant to be between her and me. Still, the day was beautiful, and I didn't want it to end. The sun hovered over the horizon as I ran up to the bridge. It was now 11 o'clock. Back home in L.A., the sun would have been gone by 4.30. Sasha was in charge of the bridge. He wore his super cool wraparound chrome sunglasses. He pointed out the red sunlight on the mountains behind us, and I began to check out all the views. Meanwhile, Stan had moved his drinking to the ship's bow. He was in a t-shirt and jeans. He usually wore sandals, but I noticed he was wearing trainers now, his way of bundling up for the 30-degree weather on deck. Isaac was out there with him, more sensibly attired in a fleece jacket and ski hat. Their glasses of beer sat on the rail between the bow cleats. Sunlight made the beer mugs glow as if they were two yellow lights. At midnight, Grigori, the Russian second mate, replaced Sasha. Casper and I sat with him on the bridge, staring at the perpetual sunset emblazoned in front of the bow. Jorgen strolled onto the deck holding a drink tray to serve as Stan and Isaac, swaddled in a black parka and a big black Russian fur cap. He took a few small steps and glanced up at the bridge to smile at us. His gait reminded me of C-3PO from Star Wars as he carried his tray. He treated out an empty bowl of chips for a fresh one and replenished the beers a routine he repeated many times in the ensuing hours. At one point, Stan tired of the tardy service and went inside, reappearing with a six-pack of beer. About twenty minutes later, there were empty cans and bowls perched on the bow rail. Casper and I spotted Emilio walking out with Jorgen to help clean up the mess. While all this was happening, I was running around snapping photographs. 
On our port side was a massively tall mountain range rising out of the ocean. This, at long last, was the physical continent of Antarctica. On the starboard side was a string of Antarctic islands. Cruising in the open water between a myriad of icebergs, the water was glassy and reflected the brilliant reds and blues in the sky. The moon rose from behind the Antarctic mountain range. At first it was yellow, then it turned red, then it turned silver once it was out of range of the fiery horizon to the south. A quarter of the southern sky was ablaze. Magic hour was frozen in time. Around two o'clock in the morning, Grigori asked Casper to watch the bridge while he went to fetch something. Isaac staggered onto the bridge. I can't take it anymore. Stan told Jorgen to bring the beer every ten minutes. I had to turn and say every twenty. Even then I can't keep up. He was hammered. I turned to Isaac. We should moon Stan. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. With that, he dropped his drawers and pressed his butt against the bridge window. I knocked on the glass to get Stan's attention and followed suit. I held my position for a few seconds, then dropped and pulled up my pants. As I stood back up, I saw Stan standing on the footwells of the bow, pants down, and spreading his cheeks open so we could see his bunghole. Then he leaned over and pointed to us, then to his butt. He repeated the gesture several times. Isaac and I burst out laughing. I opened the bridge door and shouted down, I just had a brown-eyed shag sighting! I grabbed my camera, but it seemed Stan was done splaying his cheeks. I took a photo just as Emilio was running onto the bridge to snap one as well. Emilio was awfully close for such a big lens. By the time Grigori had returned to the bridge, Isaac and I were seated again with our clothes on. Stan was not only clothed, but wearing a jacket. Fabia, his wife, came out to talk him into going to bed, but he was having none of it. At last the sun was coming up again. I could not see it, but we could see red, then yellow light, glowing on the mountainous islands on our starboard side. My goal had been to stay awake long enough to see the light break over the mountains of Antarctica. By 3.30 a.m., my bunk was calling me, and I lumbered down to my cabin to crash. When I left the bridge, Stan was still in the bow and Fabia was up again, trying to get him back into their cabin. I was dead tired when Gunner's voice boomed over the PA system at 6 o'clock. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hadn't been awoken by his voice since our 4.30 a.m. wake-up call at New Island in the Falklands. I trudged to the galley for breakfast, where I learned that Oscar had gotten up at 3.39 to see the sunrise. We had just missed each other. He had seen Stan, but wasn't sure what time Fabia got him down to bed. Neither one was at breakfast. The wild abandon of inhibition the night before was a natural progression. Crew and passengers were bonding, and the need to blow off steam comes with any vacation, or the end of a work week for that matter. Although, being on vacation allowed us to take it up a notch. We were all on the bow after our meal to view the approach of Newmire Channel, at the tip of the continent. Remarks were made about the brown-eyed shag sighting. Isaac got blamed for the moon over the bridge, while I seemed to get off scot-free. However, when Fabia and Stan came up, I showed Fabia the photo of her husband, and Dr. Smith saw it too. You were the instigator, Sven. You set me up, Stan declared with a smile. You need to delete that before the end of the cruise. I promise it won't go anywhere, I said. You're already showing it around the ship. Fabia replied. You've got a point there. Casper popped in. I've got one too. I turned to Emilio, who was close by. How did your picture of the brown-eyed shag turn out? Emilio shook his head. I was too close. It was out of focus. The water remained glassy, and the day was sunny and bright. I headed up onto the top deck to get a better view. The channel grew narrower, and I was hoping to see whales. I had not seen more than a couple blows during our entire trip. As I wandered up top, Stan spotted a pod of minky whales. I managed to see them blow a little distance from the ship, but never close enough to get a good shot. By the time we exited Newmire Channel, near Port Lockroy, the clouds had rolled in and the wind was kicking up. It started to look and feel like we were in Antarctica. We saw white mountains, black water, icebergs, and gray sky. We reached the shore of Port Lockroy by Zodiac. I felt like I was on the movie set for City of Lost Children. The rocks on shore were large and blocky and created a natural stairway into the water. There were massive chains bleeding rust onto the cold gray rock. The chains had been attached a century before so that whalers could moor their ships. It was high tide, so all sandy areas were submerged. Once ashore, we gathered outside the research station and the manager came out to give us a brief history of the location. The place had been a whaling port, then was abandoned. 
During World War II, the British were supposed to set up a base further south, but the weather was so bad they stopped here and the soldiers rebuilt the area as a base. It served as a weather and radio station until the early 60s when it was abandoned yet again. Then in the early 1990s, the British decided to make it a tourist attraction, pulling furniture and parts from other bases and recreating Port Lockroy as it appeared during its heyday in the mid-1950s. The base was smaller now. During the renovation, several of the outlying buildings had been pulled down, though the original postal tower still stood on a hill near the main building. A few old whale boats and whale bones were strewn about the site as well. There was a colony of gentoos around the base. Some of their nests were literally a foot outside the front door. We were told that being this close to the base kept the chicks safe from skewers. Every year, more gentoos built nests close to the Port Lockroy buildings. I wandered around inside for a bit, then went outside and looked at the mail tower and the foundation of the old kitchen and bunkhouse. By this time, about half of our fellow passengers were back on board the Molshanov. A heavy wind kicked up. I had been told the dent in the bow of our ship was from the previous season when the Molshanov was in this very place and the wind had slammed into her. She had dragged her anchor and had glanced into a rock. Isaac and I were waiting for the next Zodiac, but instead we saw the Molshanov draw her anchor and start to cruise out. Isaac said, Oh no, Stan and Buck have taken over the boat. In that case, I answered, I give them five minutes before they sink her. Those of us remaining on shore watched as the Molshanov turned at the mouth of the bay. Then, thankfully, we spotted Gunner buzzing toward us in a Zodiac to pick us up. Bruce explained, With this wind, the captain is taking no chances. Once everyone was aboard, we headed out for the Le Maire Channel. Gunner called it Kodak Alley because the scenery was supposed to be spectacular, and despite the thick clouds shrouding most of the peaks, it was indeed a gorgeous trip with massive mountain faces on both sides and icebergs between. We hit a few small chunks of ice and could hear them bang and scrape against our hull. I looked down onto one of the icebergs and saw two large pools of water on top, plus a tube going down to the sea. It was a luxury seal condo. We passed chinstrap penguins lounging around on ice floes. As we neared the end of the channel, we spotted a crab-eater seal on an iceberg. The mouth of the Le Maire Channel was very narrow, and I could not imagine a ship larger than ours passing through it. On the other side was a massive bay filled with icebergs and an island with the familiar orange-red roofed research observation shack. The sea was black, the sky was dark gray, and the ground was white and calm. This was it. This was exactly how I'd always pictured Antarctica. Dark, silent, calm, and white. The spot Gunner had chosen for the Zodiac landing was a little inlet with a large berg and two Weddell seals sleeping on top of it. Snowpack covered the landscape, and we found trails of human footprints all over the area. Gunner added some language to his usual shore protocol list. Stay in the human tracks. Do not step into the penguin tracks. They use those tracks to travel back and forth to the water to catch krill for their young. If you step in their runs, your footprints might go too deep, and it could trap the penguins. That would lead them to freezing or starving to death. With that advice in my head, I followed the human path up to a large hill overlooking the bay and the observation shack, where I watched Adelie penguins waddle down their separate snow paths. First you'd see a torso and head, then just a string of heads, then they'd disappear. Everything about them was comical. Navigating the snow trails was slow going for the penguins. Most fell on their stomachs and then ran with their feet, using their body as a sled, a behavior called tobogganing. This gave them far more speed on their journey. I followed most of my fellow passengers to the other side of the hilltop behind the observation shack. A large cross was built next to the shack. Four scientists had died here during a bad storm back in the mid-1990s. It was a stark reminder that this remained a very harsh and inhospitable place. On the ridge, there was a spectacular view of the open ocean. The water was black with tiny whitecaps. Icebergs filled the sea as far as the horizon. To the east, I spotted the rest of the channel, which stretched down to a chain of mountains far on the southern horizon. The channel was about two miles wide, and on the other side, great glaciers hung down to the water edge. Everything was massive. Only life was small and fragile. Afterward, I walked down to the east bank and lay down in the snow to watch the icebergs float around the channel. I stayed there for a good 15 minutes soaking in the scene. One glacier calved, spitting snow a half mile across the water. All the bergs moved slowly, as if this black ocean were made of tar. 
I could hear the ice hissing in the calm water. Sometimes the bergs would collide with a low, grinding crack. I felt like I was in another world. It was majestic, and I didn't want it to end. But soon people began to head back to the zodiacs, and I was feeling an increasingly desperate urge to pee. Despite a cautionary discussion with Oscar the day before about never drinking tea just before a landing, I had had a cup. I got up and began walking back to the water's edge, where I circled the landing site anxiously until Gunner arrived in one of the rubber boats. I hopped on. It was just he and I. Everyone else lingered to watch the Weddell seals. Gunner shouted over the outboard motor. So I heard a rumor about a sighting of two moons over the bridge. I heard one about a brown-eyed shag sighting on the bow. He shook his head. I want to sing tonight. Are you going to get stage fright again? Nope. Okay. Once aboard the ship, I quickly scrubbed my boots with disinfected, then stumbled to the nearest head. About 20 minutes later, everyone else had made it aboard. As the Molshanov cruised back out of the Lemaire Channel, most of us hung out on the bridge to watch the scenery. Big snowflakes drifted down and created a damp stillness in the air. The sea was glassy and calm. During the daily recap, Casper got his drink for taking the weather a second time. Just before Gunner finished up the routine, I nodded at him. Gunner nodded back. And before we all head off to the galley, Sven would like to attempt to sing again. I stood up from my spot near the entrance to the lounge and cracked a couple of jokes about penguins. Then I launched into my song. It was original, if not creative, and I sang it loudly and without a flub. Everyone laughed and applauded. Emilio came up to me afterwards. Can I get a copy of that for the log? Sure. I handed him my sheet of paper with the lyrics scratched on it. I just need it back because that's my only copy. No problem. We all went down to dinner. I felt very satisfied and extremely tired. It was African theme night in the kitchen, and the Jacksons, a couple and their two children from South Africa, had brought enough carved wood pens for each and every one of us. I sat across the table from Dr. Smith, and we made up stories about how rare our pens were, each trying to outdo the other in inventing the origins of our carvings. We went on and on for quite a while. I think we should all go and thank the Jacksons, Antoinette suggested. I elect Sven, shouted Stan. A few others agreed. I got up and led the way to the port side of the ship. Antoinette hustled everyone out of his or her seat, and we all crowded into the room. I cleared my throat and loudly addressed the other half of the galley. On behalf of the starboard dining room, we all want to thank the Jacksons for their gifts. The port side thanks them as well, Zara the geologist shouted. Suddenly, Gunner ran down the stairs, anxious to find out what was going on. The ship is tilting to the port side. Those who are standing, please move back to starboard. A few of us chuckled. I couldn't feel the shift in the boat at all. At some point, I had gained my sea legs, and I rarely felt the ship move unless we were in a storm. I went to bed shortly after. No one stayed up to party that night. Our reports on the beauty of the previous night prompted others to say they were going to stay up, but we never had a clear call night again. When you have an opportunity, you have to take it. Everything in Antarctica is unpredictable. Monday, December 18th, was our scheduled day to set foot on the continent, where I planned to kiss the ground. Snow would not do. I wanted rock. We were on our way to Nico Harbor, another former whaling station. It was gray and misty everywhere. Peaks of jagged white rose out of dark water. The sun glowed as a faint disk behind a gray backdrop. When we landed at Nico, the only sign I could see that this was once a whaling station were some chains tied to a rock. Beyond that, I could only see gray rock pushing out of a thick blanket of ice and snow. We trekked up a steep mountain climb next to a huge, fractured glacier. Each broken block of ice was the size of a skyscraper. I felt like an ant walking through a diorama. Bruce broke from our group to examine a gentoo colony halfway up the hill. The rest of us followed Emilio along the steep ice slope to a glacier overlook. During our trek, we spotted snowboard tracks. I thought of the snowboarding Gritviken base commander and wondered if he had recently caught a boat down here. When we reached the top, Imogene was good enough to take a photo of me kissing an outcrop of gray stone. Then I got on my back and lay at an angle so I could watch the glacier calve. We all waited in still silence for almost 10 minutes. Then, suddenly, a huge chunk of ice broke off and splashed into the water, pushing a Malshanov-sized wave out into the bay. It wasn't until afterward that we heard the reverberating crack of the ice. Emilio told us a story. 
Recently, a group of people visiting Patagonia were on the shore when a glacier calved, and the wave was so large they were swept off the beach. There was a fisherman with them, and he lost his camera. The next week, a tour group was on the same beach, and they found the fisherman's camera. The guide knew whose camera it was and gave it back to the fisherman. The camera was ruined, but the memory card still worked, and he was able to retrieve his photos. I spent another 20 minutes lying there, hoping to catch another calving iceberg. The glacier remained still. When I stood up, I saw the Jackson kids had built a little snowman just a few yards away. I wondered how many snowmen had been built on this continent. The numbers had to be small. I left the area and walked up a slope to check out the wildlife. I found Imogene and Hyam enjoying the sights. I walked down partway with Hyam, and we saw a big Weddell seal lying in the snow. More passengers surrounded the seal to take photos. Meanwhile, Gunner, Dr. Smith, Emilio, and Colin were skipping stones in the calm harbor when I joined them. Penguins frolicked all around the beach. Gunner threw a stone just as a penguin leapt from the water, and the rock barely missed it. I skipped a stone and barely missed a leaping penguin, too, so I stopped. After Nico Harbor, the Moshanov took us to Orn Island, where the weather turned bad and created whitecaps on the water. We were all on the foredeck, and Stan asked me to do a sun dance. Gunner watched me perform an idiotic pantomime and rolled his eyes. It was clear that as the trip wore on toward its end, he was getting tired of the antics. Amusingly, the sun did come out far off in the distance, but our area stayed stormy. We headed away from Orn Island and made our way to the Milkwires. On our way to our next stop, we passed a berg about three times the size of our ship that had a large arch carved in it. Just as I raised my camera to take a photo, a huge chunk of arch broke off and plunged into the sea. Grigori captured it on his video camera. The surf was still heavy when we weighed anchor for the Zodiac cruise around the mill choirs. The area was part of an Argentine base. The Molshanov anchored near the base, built on a black, rocky shore. All the windows and doors had winter shutters on them. No one was home. I was first in line on the gangway to hop in the boats. Emilio was driving, and he asked me to wait for the swell to bring the Zodiac close to the platform. The Russian who helped us on and off the boats told me to wait as well. Unfortunately, my mind was all over the place. I was sleep-deprived, it was my last day in Antarctica, I was feeling insecure about my behavior, and I had a crush on our doctor. I was unfocused when I hopped into the boat at the wrong time. Emilio and the Russian wheeled on me in anger. What the hell are you thinking? Emilio snapped at me. Sorry, was all I could muster. Eventually, the seas calmed enough to get the others down. We took off with the kids, Don, Antoinette, the Swiss couple, and Hyam aboard. The area looked like an Antarctic Lake Powell. There were tall black cliffs on either side of some very narrow channels that only small boats could navigate. The channels were numerous, about a hundred feet high and covered with snow. There were several ice caves where the sea had undercut the snow caps. One of the passages we reached was filled with nesting Antarctic terns. The little white birds shot back and forth above our heads as we motored underneath. Emilio was wary because if they felt their nests were threatened, they'd dive bomb us. We reached an area where the passage was just wide enough for our zodiac to pass. Emilio waited for a wave, then gunned the boat through. But his timing was off, and the water receded while we were in the middle of the channel. The boat caught the wall and listed 20 degrees on its side. We were out of the water and stuck. We all laughed and waited for the next wave. A half minute later, the water surged through again and lifted our boat, and Emilio charged the Zodiac out of the rock slit. Emilio ducked the boat into a different cove where a berg rocked back and forth before us, getting ready to flip. The water had eroded a tunnel through the center of it. The portion of the tunnel above the surface was five feet high, eight feet wide, and at least 15 feet long, just big enough to drive a Zodiac through. Emilio Aim the Zodiac at the berg and let the engine idle. It's going to flip any minute. We held our breath. Emilio gripped the tiller and smiled at us. Should I or shouldn't I? The Bennett kid shouted out, Do it! But Emilio only shook his head and throttled our boat towards a much larger iceberg. This one was the size of the Molshanov. Duck! he shouted, and we zoomed beneath a large overhang cut into the side of the berg. Another Zodiac popped out of a nearby channel, and we slowed down to wave at her. The Bennett kid shouted out, 
Have you seen the killer whales back the other way? The passengers got excited and the kids laughed. Our neighbors waved us off and went their separate way. Emilio checked his watch and asked, You want to see wildlife or go fast? We all shouted, Go fast! A big smile spread over Emilio's face. It was the answer he was looking for. Okay, guys, what happens on the boat stays on the boat, right? Right, we all agreed. He opened the throttle and we shot back through the narrow passage we had just left. We blasted into the cove with the rocking iceberg, and this time Emilio punched it into the ice tunnel. The tube was twice the length of our boat. Our rubber hull scraped the sides of the tube, and I touched the ice walls. We were in and out in a little over a second. It was awesome! We passed the huge berg with the overhang again. This time we saw three chin straps climbing up the side, using their beaks and clawed webbed feet to move up the ice. A fourth penguin shot out of the water as we approached and caught the steep wall with its beak. Damn what I wouldn't have done for a video camera to film our excursion through the network of channels and cliffs. It was the best Zodiac ride of the entire trip. We shot out of the group of mini islands and were about to dive back in when the Molshanov caught sight of us. Gunner's voice crackled over Emilio's radio. Emilio, Emilio, this is Gunner. Time to come back home. Emilio smiled. Darn, well guys, that's it for us. We were the last ones aboard the ship. Everyone else had come back ten minutes prior. When we reached the deck, we all sang Emilio's praises, but didn't give details. We discovered other boats had spotted a leopard seal in the waters, and that's why the chin straps were jumping onto the ice. I was a little bummed we had missed the leopard. I had wanted a close encounter. It was very late, so we bagged the recap and went straight to the back deck to say goodbye to Antarctica. Jorgen and Bruce passed out cups of rum. We all lined up for a group photo, and then Gunner gave a toast. To the White Continent! To the White Continent! We all replied and drank. It was sad to say goodbye. I drank at the bar that night. Stan had severely depleted the ship's supply of kilns, his preferred beer, the night of the full moons, and had been forced to switch to Carlsberg, which came in a green can. This unwelcome change came in spite of drastic measures to prevent such a situation. By our second week, kilns had no longer been used for the complimentary dinner drink because supplies were low, and I later found out Gunner had banned the cork team from ordering it since it was the favorite of one of the guests, i.e. Stan. The only other beer on the menu was Warsteiner, which was in a white can with some brown highlights. Stan always ordered his beer by color, blue, brown, or green. On Tuesday, December 19th, we headed into Drake's Passage with Ushuaia as our final destination. Zara gave a great lecture on living and working on the Antarctic continent. I could see how her anal retentiveness combined with her hardcore adherence to rules and regulations served her in Antarctica's harsh and unpredictable environment. She had led seven expeditions on the White Continent. Once you have a proposal accepted by the Antarctic Council, she explained, and you successfully return, it is pretty easy to go again. For my first trip, I surrounded myself with experienced people who helped me obtain my gear and plan the trip out. You need to document every supply, down to the last can of beans. Once your grant is approved, your supplies are sorted out and stored in a cage over the winter. When you show up in Mactown, McMurdo Station, in October, you have to check your supplies and practice packing it in the storeroom. Once you're in Mactown, you cannot ask for anything else. If you ask for an extra backpack, they'll say, sorry, should have thought of that when you plan for the trip. Each time we left, my team boarded a large military plane and they drop us off on the ice. On my third expedition, the flight crew forgot to push our pallet of food off the plane. My team had to radio for it. The pilot told us he did not have enough fuel for an additional landing and takeoff. He wound up flying over a landing site while the crew pushed the pallet out of the back of the plane. When the pallet hit the ice, it exploded. My team spent hours picking up our supplies from the ice. On most of my expeditions, we would leave the supplies at the drop spot in return for anything we needed during the months we spent conducting research. Zara had made a few expeditions in the dry valleys, and it sounded like she had some amazing years on the ice. Are you going again? I asked after her lecture. I have to submit my plan by March if I'm going to go. Two and a half months is barely enough time to put together a proposal. They have to be precise. There's a lot of pre-planning that goes into one. Sounds amazing. I secretly wished I had become a scientist so I could sign up. 
I began thinking about quitting my job and becoming a short-order cook in Mactown, anything to be a part of a larger Antarctic adventure. Later that afternoon, Colin lectured about his two years on South Georgia. Before I start, I'd like to promise that I will not say krill during this entire lecture. If I do, I pledge a dollar to the Antarctic Preservation Society for each infraction. And I'll be happy to count, Bruce chimed in. Colin had great photos of the folks he worked with. The base functioned as a commune. Everyone had a hand in cooking, and during the winter they explored the island. Colin was an amateur photographer and had taken an amazing photo of lenticular clouds. Years later, I noticed he had published it in a book that was being sold at the Getty Museum. Colin also talked about the illegal fishing ship they had caught the year before we arrived. The ship was harvesting Patagonia toothfish, a.k.a. Chilean sea bass, in the waters of South Georgia without a license. To keep the fish from disappearing, there were a strict number of licenses issued, and each one was very pricey. Colin's boss, the South Georgia Research Facility Supervisor, had joined with the governor of the Falklands to decide the fate of the impounded boat, which they agreed to blow up in the harbor. They wanted to set an example and send a warning to all poachers that there was zero tolerance for fishing without a license. The fishing ship was basically a hulk, and her days at sea were numbered anyway. Her crew was not very good at fishing. These facts were overlooked when the press covered the sinking of the fishing ship. At the end of the presentation, Bruce announced, Colin, you said krill three times. We all laughed. Colin smiled. I'll just round the donation up to twenty dollars then. That night after dinner, we were presented with a few items. Our Caldera swim certificates, our stepping foot on Antarctica certificates, and our tabs for the trip. I noticed my certificates were printed with a D in my last name, but at least they got the first name right. That night, Casper and I talked about personality traits we appreciated in others. Have you heard of Lagome? he asked. I shook my head. Can't say as I have. In the Swedish culture, we all appreciate Lagome. Lagome means someone who is even keeled. They are not overly excited, they are humble, and they bear what life has to give like a good Swede. Lagome is enjoying the status quo. Lagome is respected in Swedish society. So Lagome is understatement. Antarctica could be considered Lagome. Most of us come here thinking we'll just see white with a few shades of gray, but there's so much more beyond first impressions. Casper smiled. It's not usually applied to place, but yes, you're right. I nodded. I thought about Gunner and how he looked at me when I did my sun dance the day before. I did not have Lagome at that moment. But Lagome would also not get you very far in the U.S. I, on the other hand, don't fall into this category. Not usually, no. But you are more even keeled than most Americans I have met. I notice you like to listen, Casper continued. You enjoy other stories, and you do not have the need to tell your story first. You may be a faux Swede, but you do have a little Lagome in you. Thank you, Casper. I appreciate the compliment. If you ever need a place to stay in Sweden, give me a call. Thank you, Casper. Please do the same if you're ever in Los Angeles. The next day was our last together. I woke up to find Casper had a new military buzz cut. Big Sasha had given him the standard cut everyone on the Russian crew received. We learned that Stan's bar bill had come in at a significant number in the four-figure area. Emilio and Isaac each gave a slideshow of the highlights of our trip. Oscar, Antoinette, Imogene, and I did one more round of animal impressions at our table hanging croissants on our noses to look more like elephant seals. We all disembarked late morning on December 20th. When I went through customs in Buenos Aires, I was hassled by agents who had spotted my passport stamp for the Falklands and was grilled for several minutes about why I had gone there. I reflected on all the people I had met and their different alternative lifestyles. I realized that for a long time, I had had it all wrong. Since as far back as I could remember, I had been told success was defined by having a great job, buying a big house, driving a nice car, and raising a family. It's what my parents and all my friends' parents thought. Something did not compute. Families today cannot afford homes on one income. They worked their asses off to get what our parents worked half the time and spent a fraction of the money to achieve. But it does not necessarily make them happy. As long as people live a life of meaning and purpose, there are a million ways to achieve success. Money is not the end goal. I was tired of working 80 hours a week and trying to prove myself every day. How many times had I heard someone say, you can never rest on your laurels. You're only as good as today's achievements. 
What have you done for me lately? It was the corporate mantra. I no longer wanted to subscribe. Maybe I should continue renting an apartment and try to travel more. I felt more alive when I wrote or traveled. Upon my return to Los Angeles on December 22nd, I drove to work and sorted through 6,000 emails. The trip to the White Continent and all those lives I had intersected began to fade away. And by New Year, I was back to subscribing to the corporate mantra. The idea of moving to another state and keeping a low overhead in order to write continued to percolate in my brain. I figured I could always finish my travels by backpack. But then I met someone who changed all my future plans.